it begs the question, given the response Israel had to the U.N. security vote today, this resolution clearly that they are upset about, yet what does the resolution actually change for Israel? Well, this resolution, as with many U.N. resolutions that aren't under what's called Chapter 7, is non-binding. That means that it is a show of a message or unity of the U.N. Security Council. It is a statement. It's something that is meant to show the views of the international community, if you will, and certainly the strongest powers at the U.N. But it's not enforceable by any means. It's called non-binding. But still, that doesn't mean that it wasn't a strong message. It clearly was, since Israel, as you mentioned, they canceled their trip to Washington, D.C. It was a significant move for the U.S. to abstain from this resolution. There is, uh, it, while the U.S. has abstained before on resolutions related to Israel, it is not common. Um, it's it's not that there isn't precedent for it, but the last time it happened was 2016, when, uh, when the U.N. Uh, Security Council declared settlements to be illegal and the U.S. abstained from that resolution. Uh, but since then, there hasn't been another one. So it is, it's a very big deal. Was Benjamin Netanyahu Hagar just looking for an excuse to cancel this delegation? Things had been growing more and more tense as as time had been growing, and, and in fact, the the rumors over the weekend were already so that so before the resolution were that uh, that he was considering canceling, or that he was telling his 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 advisors that and his aides who were who were traveling that maybe maybe not to pursue it. And to be fair. It, the, the fact that the U.S. abstained on the resolution was also not expected. Uh, it was a surprise to most of us. I myself expected the U.S. to veto, as it had for the last several rounds. Uh, there have been, this is the fifth resolution that has come to the U.N. Security Council. The fourth one was on Friday. That was a U.S. draft that Russia and China vetoed. This resolution, what made it different is that um, it does not condemn Hamas, which is uh, which was in the U.S. drafted one. And while it calls for the release of hostages, it doesn't tie the release of hostages directly as a condition for a ceasefire, which is something that the U.S. insists on as well. Um, all that to be said is that things had been growing tense because of the U of the increasing calls by the United States to uh, for Israel not to go into Rafa. And that is a key point here, because while John Kirby has said, uh, and, and, and your White House correspondent reiterated this, that this is not a shift in policy, it's not a shift in policy. But that said, the policy has evolved. And uh, I don't believe the U.S. would have abstained from this resolution had it not been for their strong call on Israel not to go into Rafah. Well, we certainly heard that call this weekend, Hagar, from Vice President Kamala Harris. She was on ABC's this week yesterday and was asked about the relationship with Israel and what happens if they do go into Rafah. Just take a listen to what she said. Netanyahu appears to just be flat out ignoring President Biden's warning about an offensive in Rafah. Is that a red line for your administration? We have been clear in multiple conversations and in every way that any major military operation in Rafah would be a huge mistake. And she went on to say, Hagar, that she wasn't ruling anything out in terms of consequences for Israel if they were to push forward with what she characterized as a mistake. What would those consequences look like? Right. It's a little bit of tough love here, because what, what, what the vice president was trying to really show here is that as a friend to Israel, the U.S. is telling Israel not to do this because it is uh, because of the friendship we have, because we care about Israel's security. And also, by the way, because it, there is significant uh, it, it, it could backlash in the United States as well. You could see um, increased anger, increased terrorist threats uh, against the United States. And so what the, the to answer your question, though, about what could happen, you have already a discussion happening on Capitol Hill about making aid to Israel, uh, military aid appropriations conditional. And for, for without a doubt that 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 would that would grow. And that is outside of the control of the White House, really. Now, the White House is at the end would be the one to sign any kind of bill. But but if, if the majority of Congress decides that, that they have to make this aid conditional, because they have such serious concerns about how Israel approaches this war, then that that is the that's the most significant. But that I wouldn't go beyond that. I don't expect, for example, the relationship to completely falter or to fall, or Israel to not to no longer be an ally. Um, but that but that's how I would view it mostly is this question of whether the aid becomes conditional.
spending time with Hagar Shamali here on Balance of Power. I need to ask you about this horrifying terror attack in Russia and the blame game that we're now uh, witnessing here, Hagar, with reporting that the U.S. did provide a warning to Russia. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre was asked about this uh, in the briefing room. Here's what she said. In early March, the United States, uh, the gov this government, shared information with Russia about a planned terrorist, uh, terror attack in Moscow. We were very clear about that. On March 7th, uh, we actually informed uh, Americans in Russia uh, to, to uh, get, did a public advisory, to be more specific. And, uh, you know, ISIS bears the sole responsibility here. The sole responsibility, and Mr. Putin understands that. We shared that with, the, with their government. And so there is no evidence, absolutely no evidence, that Ukraine was involved here. Well, Vladimir Putin, uh, Hagar, is blaming Islamist militants, but also continuing to, to tie this somehow uh, to Ukraine. How does the administration handle this? Right. A lot of this is about being ahead of the information war, because what Putin is doing is extremely mm -hmm. dangerous by tying this to Ukraine, because not only is he using this attack, which, by the way, the idea that it was is Ukraine is absurd. And anybody who studies these uh, how these attacks are pursued, by the way, whether it's the Ukrainian attacks that have happened inside Russia's borders and ISIS attacks, this has all the markings of an ISIS attack. And we saw a very recent one take place in Iran only a couple of months ago. It's very similar. This is the same group that pursued that massive attack in Afghanistan when the Taliban mm -hmm. took over and the government fell. So anyway, all this to say that what Putin is doing is very dangerous. He's using this attack, obviously, to to garner, to, to, to increase Russian anger toward Ukraine among the public and to garner support for his war. And that's dangerous because then he could use this attack to justify some kind of horrific attack in Ukraine. And now you have the U.S. is basically, that's why the U.S. is trying to win this information war and come out ahead. And they did come out ahead. And by the way, I can tell you, having been in government a long time, the duty to warn is something the United States government takes very seriously. And it's one of the things I like to say just highlights how good the United States government is, where it doesn't matter if it's an adversary. If they see something where innocents are going to be harmed, they go to that government and they warn them and say, here's this intelligence we have. We feel a responsibility to share this with you. Now, please take action against it. And from the beginning of that March 7th statement, Putin went out against it and said that the U.S. and the West were working to instigate problems. And it, that and ultimately, that stems from an insecurity. Now, all of it is very dangerous, but to ultimately to answer your question on how the U.S. handles it, they have to keep beating yeah. this drum publicly to, infer, to win this war, this information war, and work with the Russians behind the scenes and just say, you know, no, mm -hmm. you're not going to pursue something against you know the truth, so stop with your propaganda.